So, welcome to the second Maddingley Lecture of the academic year. I'm Rebecca Lingwood, the Director of the Institute of Continuing Education here at Maddingley Hall. And first, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our chair for tonight, P Professor Tim Crane. And then he will introduce our speaker, Professor Colin McGinn, and chair questions at the end of this evening's lecture. Professor Tim Crane is Knightbridge Professor of Philosophy here at Cambridge and Fellow of Peterhouse. Tim was educated at the universities of Durham, York and Cambridge, where he received his PhD in 1989. Before returning to Cambridge, he was Professor of Philosophy at University College London. He founded the University of London's Institute of Philosophy in 2005 and was its director until 2008. He's been an academic visitor at a multitude of prestigious universities, and we're really delighted to have him chairing this evening. So just before I hand over um, to Tim, can I remind you that if you've got your mobile phones with you this evening, now's the time to switch them off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and good evening. And thank you, Rebecca, for that introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Colin McGinn here to Maddingley Hall to give the Maddingley Lecture. Um, it's a particular personal pleasure for me because I think I, when I studied philosophy uh, many years ago, um, I think I learned pretty much everything that I knew then, and probably everything I know now from Colin McGinn, uh, and Descartes maybe, um, <laughs> and a few other uh, distinguished philosophers. Um, Colin is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Miami. Previously he was at... Um, Rutgers University in, in New Jersey. Uh, before that, he was the Wild Reader in Mental Philosophy at the University of Oxford. And before that, he was at uh, University College London, where he, which was his first job after studying in Oxford. Um, he's worked on a wide range of subjects within philosophy. Uh, he has, in, in, the, in the information you have, it says that, he, that he's published 20 books, uh, I think since that was written, he's published another five. He's in, enormously prolific. Um, his work is, is readable, original, and always interesting. And it's a great pleasure to have him here tonight to talk about the science of philosophy. Colin. Uh, thank you, Tim, for that very nice introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here in Cambridge to give this lecture despite the fact that I'm not used to the cold anymore having lived in Miami now for about seven years so I've been cold ever since I arrived actually I feel reasonably comfortable now which is which is nice. you see I'm wearing my jumper what we say in America my sweater um, so um, let me proceed to my lecture uh, it's called the science of philosophy uh, what is the nature of philosophy Two views have been influential. One view is that philosophy is continuous with science, a kind of proto-science or a commentary on the sciences or a synthesis of the sciences. According to this view, philosophy is an empirical discipline, though more removed from the data than typical science. It is not different in kind from physics, chemistry and biology. Thus, the subject of philosophy comes under the general heading of science because of its methodological similarity to the regular sciences. Historically, it once contained the sciences, which eventually broke off from it, and it's still a kind of science in waiting. Pupil science, we might say. The second view is that philosophy is quite unlike empirical science, both in methodology and subject matter. It is an a priori discipline, removed from observation and experiment. According to this view, philosophy is, con philosophy is to be contrasted with, contrasted with empirical science and is often regarded as properly one of the humanities. In its purest form, the second view takes philosophy to consist of conceptual analysis aimed at establishing a priori necessary truths, the very antithesis of empirical science. Thus, philosophy is held not to be a branch of science, having its own distinctive nature as a field of inquiry. I hew to the second view. Philosophy is conceptual analysis. I won't be defending this view here. I will presuppose it. My question is whether it is, it is correct to withhold the designation science from philosophy so conceived? Is it consistent to hold that philosophy consists of conceptual analysis and that it's a science? I shall argue that these are compatible propositions. 
and I shall further contend that philosophy is a science, indeed that it can be rightly described as an empirical, experimental, natural science. These may seem like surprising claims, but actually they spring from obvious linguistic facts. Thus philosophy, for me, consists of the a priori analysis of concepts, and it is also an empirical, experimental, natural science, with no tension between these traits. Moreover, all of this is trivially true. What is science? Better, what does the word science mean? Here one naturally reaches for the dictionary. Consulting the, Oxford, the concise Oxford English Dictionary, 11th edition, we find two definitions. One, quote, the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behaviour of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Definition two, a systematically organised body of knowledge on any subject. The word comes from the Latin scientia, uh, knowledge, which is from shire, no. For scientific, we find, this first definition, relating to or based on science. Second definition, systematic, methodical. These definitions are worth careful study. The first definition of science would apply to the analysis of concepts construed as part of the natural world up till the phrase through observation and experiment. But I, I'm going to talk further about even those terms. Presumably this definition is deemed by the dictionary editors to cover only part of the accepted meaning of the term because it excludes what are traditionally called the formal sciences, arithmetic, geometry, mathematical logic, abstract computer science, game theory, information theory, general systems theory and the like. These sciences are not empirical in the usual sense, they're not based on observation and experiment, but they are sufficiently rigorous, organised and systematic to qualify as sciences. So it's not the status of a discipline as empirical that makes it a science. The, this adjective applies also to history and geography, which are not sciences. But whether the subject achieves the right level of internal rigour and systematic organisation. We can say right away then that philosophy will not be disqualified from falling into the category of science simply because it's not empirical. A priori science, that phrase, is not a contradiction in terms, as the phrase formal science is not a contradiction in terms. Philosophy properly belongs with the formal sciences, not the empirical sciences, but is no less a science for that, and nor is it any less scientific. But the dictionary will only take us so far here. We need to identify the marks of genuine science and see whether philosophy <coughs> shares these marks. And we must not bias our discussion by favouring such sciences as physics and chemistry. I take it that what distinguishes a discourse as scientific are such traits as these. Rigour, clarity, literalness, organisation, generality, laws or general principles, technicality, explicitness, public criteria of evaluation, refutability, hypothesis testing, expansion of common sense with the possibility of undermining common sense, inaccessibility to the, to the layman, theory construction, symbolic articulation, axiomatic formulation, learned journals, rigorous and lengthy education, professional societies, and a sense of apartness from naive opinion. Thus, mathematics, as much as physics, is inherently difficult to understand, arduous to learn, rigorous, technical, jargon-filled, <coughs> highly general and abstract, based on objective epistemic procedures, proof, not experiment, specialised, professionalised, and so on. Given all this, it would be arbitrary to deny that mathematics is a science, and historically it has been so classified, as in Gauss's famous remark, mathematics is the queen of the sciences. Only misplaced ideology would insist that physics is a science, but mathematics is not. Being non-empirical is not to the point. Thus the attribute of being based on observation is not a necessary condition for being a science, nor is it a sufficient condition, or else random remarks about what's going on around you would be science, it would be empirical. Now it seems to me clear that contemporary academic philosophy, as it is practised in typical university philosophy departments, has exactly the marks I've just recited. It is technical, rigorous, jargon-filled, difficult to master, expansive of common sense, or at variance with it sometimes, explicitly articulated, and so on. Someone might balk at the attribution of refutability in theory construction, holding that nothing like the physicist's experimental testing and empirical theory construction applies to philosophical claims. But again, we must not bias the discussion by presupposing dubious paradigms of the scientific. The obvious fact is that philosophers revel in the construction and refutation of arguments of highly explicit and articulated kinds, often symbolically formulated. And when they propose a conceptual analysis, they offer necessary and sufficient conditions that may easily be refuted by ingenious 
counterexample. We philosophers are often wrong and demonstrably so. We propose theories of concepts, for example, the causal theory of perception, and our theories may be falsified. Also, the presence within philosophy of formal logic, philosophy of logic, philosophy of language, philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, philosophy of psychology, and even theories of uh, abstract theories of justice, like Rawls's, all testify the to the infinity of philosophy with science, even if the philosopher is just in the business of analysing concepts, both scientific concepts and common sense concepts. My own view is that philosophy can be aptly described as the logic of concepts, and I take it that logic is a formal science in good standing, so philosophy is a logical science as I conceive of philosophy. Not only is contemporary analytical philosophy a science, we can also fairly claim that philosophy was the first science, long before the formation of physics, chemistry, and so on as empirical sciences. Philosophy attained the status of science well before physics ever did. To see this, just compare the physics of the pre-Socratics with the metaphysics of Aristotle. The former is oracular, poetic, and unsystematic, as much myth as fact, while the latter, Aristotle's, is carefully worked out, rigorous, and systematic. It's scientific in the dictionary sense. Geometry has some claim to be the original science, it's a formal science, of course, not an empirical science, but Aristotle's syllogistic logic can reasonably, claim, can reasonably claim to be one of the earliest forms of scientific study, when physics and chemistry were just glints in the eye of ancient thinkers. The science is later split off from philosophy, but philosophy was already a science. Metaphysics was a science before physics was, and Aristotle's metaphysics holds up better today than his physics. To the unprejudiced eye, physics owes its present scientific status to a combination of sound philosophy and advanced mathematics, that is, to the achievements of the formal sciences. Without a solid methodological philosophy, itself arrived at a priori, and without the achievements of mathematics, especially geometry and calculus, themselves also arrived at a priori, physics would not be the imposing scientific edifice it is today. Empirical observation is only part of the story. I'll talk about this a little bit later. One might even say that philosophy at its origins was the consummate science, especially symbolic logic, the model and ideal for other disciplines. It took physics and chemistry a long time to catch up. Now I must deal with two objections to my classificatory picture. First, if we classify philosophy as a science, do we not deny that it belongs to the humanities? And isn't philosophy largely concerned with the human? Here again, the dictionary provides a useful starting point. For humanities, the OED gives, quote, learning concern with human culture, especially literature, history, art, music, and philosophy. The obvious reply to this natural objection is that science and the humanities so defined are not mutually exclusive. In principle, there can be a science of human culture. So if philosophy is one of the humanities and the humanities are about human culture, then it could be a science of human culture. Aren't anthropology, sociology, social psychology, and economics precisely sciences of human culture in a broad sense? Suppose we agree that the human conceptual scheme is part of human culture, not part of human biology, suppose we thought that, then studying human concepts is by definition the province of the humanities. But why can't this study itself be a science? Isn't the study of concepts by cognitive science a science? And yet we're, we are agreeing that human concepts are part of human culture. There's simply no logical opposition here. Some kinds of study of written texts attain to the status of science, like word frequency counts and so on computerized studies. So languages, language studies can qualify as science too, and isn't linguistics a science, yet with language part of human culture? It isn't the subject matter that counts, but the style, the methods, and the results. But, and this is even more obvious, it is simply false that philosophy is exclusively about human culture, even if its method is agreed to be conceptual analysis. Four large tracts of philosophy concern the non-human world, the essential nature of space, time, and matter, causation, necessity, probability, and laws, consciousness, choice, perception, knowledge, justification, and truth. Some of these subject areas indeed concern the psychological, but that doesn't make them an aspect of human culture. They may rather be part of the biological world and may also apply to other animals. Other animals have consciousness, perception, and so on. But, any, but anyway, many of these areas of study are not even about psychological matters, so philosophy isn't one of the humanities, since if the humanities is about human culture, it's not even about human culture. As a dictionary quite reasonably defines the term, this is about the whole world, not specifically the human world. Some parts of philosophy do deal with aspects of human culture, aesthetics, philosophy of law, social theory, maybe some of ethics, but many do not. I would not myself want to describe human concepts as part of human culture, though they are rightly described as psychological entities, so I don't think that conceptual analysis is ipso facto a study of a component of human culture. At any rate, there is no good objection here to counting philosophy as a science in good standing. 
The second objection I want to consider is more serious. You might agree that the distinctive method of philosophy does not preclude its being a science, but you might also fasten onto another aspect of the dictionary definition of science, that a science is an organised system of knowledge. And here the objection is apt to be that philosophy cannot boast an established set of results, a body of accepted knowledge agreed upon by all and neatly set out in the philosophy textbooks. For where are the philosophical facts to be set beside the facts of physics, chemistry and biology? Philosophy, it will be said, does not make the kind of progress made in the science, including the formal sciences. It just isn't as epistemically solid. The very idea of philosophical knowledge is an oxymoron, a sheer fantasy. Now, there's much to be said about this kind of objection to the scientific standing of philosophy, but I shall try to be brief. First, we must not underestimate how much knowledge philosophy has actually acquired of a quite straightforward sort, mainly in the way of establishing certain distinctions. That is, philosophers have clarified certain important distinctions that were previously blurred and unrecognised. And this is real cognitive pro progress. For instance, use and mention, type and token, particular and general, name and quantifier, necessary and contingent, fact and value, knowledge and belief, analytic and synthetic, sense and reference, character and content, implication and implicature, and so on. A number of distinctions which analytic philosophers and others have clarified, and that's a definite piece of cognitive progress. Second, philosophy has discovered and articulated the various theoretical options that are available in any given problematic area, even if it has not actually settled which options are the true ones. It has mapped out the philosophical geography, and this too is, is genuine progress in what we know. Knowing what these options are and appreciating their strengths and weaknesses is a large part of what's, what makes philosophy appealing to many of us. We hadn't thought of them before, before we came to the subject, and they add to our store of knowledge. They, they also expand our imagination. But still it may be retorted, don't the scientists do more than merely articulate the theoretical options? Don't they decide which, op which, are in which are correct and which are incorrect? Well, that depends. The further from direct observation the science becomes, the harder it is to produce consensus and conclusive verification. Contemporary quantum theory is an obvious case in point. Many options and no agreed way to settle which is right. So is theoretical physics not a science? Because you can't settle which of those theories are correct. Biology cannot decide how life originated on Earth, so, so, though some options have been sketched out. So is biology not a science? Psychology is notoriously riven by disagreement, sometimes fundamental. But it would be a stern linguistic policeman who denied the label science to psychology, ditto economics and sociology. No science is immune to controversy and polarised opinion once you get beyond the lower reaches of the discipline. But there is a more telling point to be made concerning difficult and easy science. Suppose I establish a new field of study called mystrionics, in which all the hardest questions of science are to be pursued, from physics, biology, psychology and so on. No easy questions are, allowed, are to be allowed in mystrionics. Then clearly this subject will make little solid factual progress compared, say, to botany or geography, precisely because it is about the most difficult questions of all. We might say that mystrionics encompasses the hard sciences with hard now connoting sheer intellectual difficulty. Should we say that this subject, mystrionics, is not science at all? That seems to limit the word unduly to easy science. We might call this field easiatrics. So surely science can come in, deg in degrees of difficulty, and it is invidious to withhold the label from the tougher questions. But then isn't a subject called philosophy really a name for a subject that deals with really difficult questions, though sometimes with easy ones? So the degree of difficulty of philosophy shouldn't be interpreted as an inherent lack of scientific status. Speculative, problematic, hard-to-do science is still science, and it may be necessary and unavoidable science for any intellectually honest and adventurous inquirer. As long as the questions are real and the standards of investigation are rigorous, we can still claim the title science. If physics and chemistry had proved harder to do than has emerged historically, would they not then be sciences? And just because it's relatively easy to establish particular historical or geographical facts doesn't make these studies into, the, into science, or, or the best science. Degree of difficulty is beside the point. We should certainly not let crude, outdated positivism dictate how the term science is to be applied. And, in the positivist view was basically to be scientific is to be conclusively verifiable. Well, it's, that's neither necessary nor sufficient for being a science. I am resisting the idea that certain sciences constitute paradigms for what a science must be. The science is regularly deemed empirical. In particular, I am rejecting the notion that there is any necessary link between the concept of a science and the concept of observation. Some sciences are observational and some are not. 
we, we must avoid the fallacy of the misplaced paradigm here as elsewhere, which is often the science of physics. There's simply nothing in the meaning of the word science, or in the concept of science, to entail that a science must be based on observation. That is, perception by means of the outer senses of objects and events in the scientist's environment. So in saying that philosophy is a science, I'm certainly not saying that its philosophy is based on observation, like physics. I am saying that despite not being based on observation, philosophy is a science, and has been for a long time. Nor is it my view that philosophy must be refashioned in order to become like a science. It is already a science. This is true even of the part of philosophy called ethics, which could be called axiological science. The phrase moral science already exists, so I don't need to explain to anybody from Cambridge University. There can be a science of value, i.e. a systematic, rigorous study involving generalizations and demonstrations. If philosophy consists of conceptual analysis, then it is, in Kantian, Kantian terminology, an ampliative science, not in augmentative science. It's analytic rather than synthetic. But again, there is, there, there is no good reason to insist that augmentation of knowledge is definitive of science, as long, so long as the other features are present. If mathematics is likewise, likewise ampliative, that is analytic, not augmentative, that is no reason to deny that it is a science, though in, of course a formal science. It might now be conceded there is no linguistic impropriety in applying the word science to the discipline of philosophy, but maintain that certain key distinctions still exist between philosophy and other sciences, distinctions that blunt the force of the application of that word. Thus it will be said that philosophy is neither an experimental science, nor an empirical science, nor a natural science. These characteristics are usually taken to connote epistemic virtues, in which case philosophy lacks the virtues that are typical of other sciences. It is a science in name only, it may be said, lacking the traits that constitute the distinctive virtues of sciences in general. Is this line of thinking justified? I shall now argue that it is not. Is conceptual analysis experimental? The OED defines experiment as follows, quote, a scientific procedure undertaken to make a discovery, test a hypothesis or demonstrate a known fact, from the Latin experiri, which means try. It doesn't mean anything more than that in, the, in its etymology. I take the primary sense here to be that of testing a hypothesis. So does the activity of conceptual analysis test hypotheses? I suggest that it does. For this procedure involves the production of a hypothesis about the analysis of a concept, specifically a set of putative necessary insufficient conditions, which is then tested by means of what we call thought experiments. For example, we might propose the hypothesis that knowledge is simply true belief, initially proposed by Plato, and then questioned by him, and test that hypothesis by imagining cases in which a subject has true beliefs and asking ourselves whether he or she has knowledge. And we might go on to produce a counterexample in the shape of a subject who has a true belief that is completely unjustified. And we wouldn't say that's knowledge, classic. Epistemology 101. We might then amend the hypothesis to maintain that knowledge is true, justified belief and proceed as before, wondering whether those conditions are necessarily sufficient, finding that these conditions are not sufficient either, as we come across what are now called Gettier cases. We've conducted an experiment in our mind to test the analytic hypothesis we have conjectured to be true. It consists, this experiment, of conceiving possible cases in which the conditions are met and then asking ourselves whether our understanding of the concept indicates that the concept applies in these cases. True, we did not make any perceptual observations in performing such a thought experiment, but the dictionary did not specify that experiments must be conducted by deploying the senses perceptually. The heart of the definition is trying out a conjecture in an open-minded spirit and coming up with a refutation. We certainly did not presuppose an answer to our question, about the analysis of knowledge in my example, before undertaking the procedure, we let the proceed to decide the question only after it had been completed. The hypothesis makes certain predictions about our intuitions, as they're often called, in possible cases, and then we check to see if our intuitions confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis. The intuitions function as evidence for or against the hypothesis, and they are grounded in our actual grasp of the concept in question. So it is not wrong to describe the method of conceptual analysis as an experimental procedure. This is quite literally true, as the dictionary defines the word and as we normally understand it. Maybe uttering the sentence, conceptual analysis is experimental science, will typically have conversational implicatures that are false, conjuring up images of physical dissections of concepts and bunts and burners of the mind. But in its literal content, it is a perfectly true statement. It has no false logical implications. Thought experiments are indeed experiments, as that word, the phrase suggests. 
just as we would naively suppose. We have here a procedure that arrives at truth in a non-question-begging way by consulting a body of data, intuitions, generated especially for the purpose. I can imagine an opponent sputtering that these so-called experiments are not conducted in a laboratory like real scientific experiments with suitable equipment. There is no such thing as a philosophy lab, somebody will say. But is that true? Here's how the definition, here's, sorry, here's how the dictionary defines the word laboratory. A room or building equipped for scientific experiments, research or teaching, from the Latin laborare, to labour. So the core notion refers to a space expressly set aside for performing scientific experiments, as opposed to a space set aside for day-to-day -day living or throwing parties or darts matches. But don't philosophers have rooms especially set aside for research purposes, spaces in which they philosophically labour? We call them studies or offices or seminar rooms. I shuffle into my study in order to do philosophical research work, and in that room I often carry out thought experiments to test analytical, analytic hypotheses. Am I not spending my time in my philosophy lab? The implications of saying this, in certain contexts, will doubtless include suggestions of white coats and expensive equipment, but there is nothing literally false in the proposition itself. I am simply labouring to make philosophical discoveries in the space set aside for making such discoveries. There are many kinds of laboratory, varying in their contents according to the subject in question. If I am pressed to specify what equipment I use in my lab, my philosophy lab, I might reply that I require a chair and desk with suitable writing materials and some peace and quiet. These are, the, these are the tools of research that I employ. Physicists more grandly have their massive particle accelerators, why philosophers are much cheaper to fund as scientists and theoretical physicists or experimental physicists. I work in a lab performing thought experiments, and my most precious tool is my brain, which is, comes pretty cheap. My interlocutor might, at this point, reluctantly agree that I am guilty of no outright linguistic solecism in describing conceptual analysis as experimental, but insist that such experiments hardly qualify as empirical, here the question becomes trickier, because empirical can mean several things. Let us again turn to the dictionary for some initial guidance. Empirical is defined as, quote, based on, concerned with, or verifiable by observation or experience, rather than theory or pure logic, from the Greek empiria, experience. Now we, can, now we can agree that conceptual analysis is not perceived by observation, but what about experience? During a thought experiment, don't we have certain experiences, what might be called conceptual experiences? Conscious cognition is one variety of experience in a suitably wide sense. Not all experience is sense experience. When I judge that I have imagined a case of true belief that is not knowledge, do I not report the certain conscious experience that I had? The conscious episodes called intuitions are just a type of cognitive experience, part of my total phenomenology at that time. Similarly, we may have mathematical experiences, as when a proof is appreciated and accepted. In the case of conceptual analysis, the intuitions play an evidential role, so we can say that they constitute empirical or experiential evidence in this broad sense. We certainly did not proceed from pure theory or logic without regard for any new cognitive input. We were open to new cognitive experiences. Thought experiments are thus rightly described as empirical in a perfectly good sense of the word. Indeed, we can even describe them as a posteriori, in the sense that they establish their results only after certain experiences have been obtained. They do not dogmatically, they're not dogmatically held quite independently of what experience may bring. That's just a bad, naive sense of the word a priori. Conceptual analysis is a posteriori in the sense that you have to do the analysis first and you consult your intuitions and you come to a conclusion. It's only after the analytic investigation has been completed that the conceptual analysis is accepted. It is not dogmatically presupposed at the start. It now appears that philosophy and physics are alike in being experimental <coughs> empirical sciences, cleaving strictly to what these words literally mean. So what distinguishes them? Here we might appeal to the notion of perception. Physics relies on perception of things, but philosophy conceived as conceptual analysis does not. Surely that distinction is rock solid. Not quite. The dictionary get, must again give us pause. Under perceive we find, the quote, become aware or conscious of, from Latin, Percipire, seize or understand. There's nothing here restricting perception to the five or more senses. Intellectual perception is a type of perception too. Thus I can be said to perceive that true belief is not sufficient for knowledge by conducting an appropriate thought experiment. Here the word perceive is synonymous with the word apprehend, which has both sensory and intellectual forms. We can apprehend with our senses, we can apprehend with our intellect. Thus philosophical investigation involves perception in this capacious sense. 
I often become aware or conscious of something while engaged in philosophical thought. I see that something is so. But we can easily recast the thought behind this suggested differentia by bringing in the senses explicitly. Philosophy does not depend on perception by means of the senses. Even here we must tread carefully, since one traditional view is that we have an inner sense capable of sensing what lies within, in that place where concepts lurk in our mind. According to that view, I do sense the analysis of my concepts because I use my inner sense to gain insight into them. The obvious amendment here is to qualify the word sense by the word outer. Philosophy, unlike physics, is not based evidentially on the deliverances, deliverances of outer sense. OK, the dictionary provides a useful gloss on this philosophical notion. Sense is defined as faculty by which the body perceives an external stimulus, one of the faculties of, scent, of sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch, from the Latin sentiero, sentire, feel. And that notion of sense certainly excludes conceptual analysis, since I don't use my bodily senses of sight, smell, etc. to excavate the content of my concepts. If you use the word observation to capture the use of the senses in this narrow sense, the outer senses, then we can correctly say, finally, that physics is based on observation and philosophy is not. But notice that we can still claim that philosophy has the qualities, in both the descriptive and normative sense, of empirical experimental science. The methodological gap is therefore not as wide as we might initially have thought. Is philosophy a natural science? I think there are two senses in which it is. First, it is not a supernatural science, which looks like a contradiction. It doesn't deal with the supernatural, unlike, say, theology. In this sense, the formal sciences are also natural sciences because they're not supernatural. But philosophy differs from the formal sciences and it can also be about objects that exist in nature as numbers and the like do not. They exist in the abstract world, whatever that is. Metaphysics deals with the nature of material objects and causation, say. And philosophy of mind deals with consciousness and choice, and philosophy of language, language deals with human natural languages. The subject matter consists of things that exist in the natural world, not in the abstract world. It is therefore entirely appropriate to say that philosophy is, or can, is a natural science. Concepts themselves are perfectly natural entities in both senses of the word. They're just uh, mental entities. We can even describe both philosophical and physical knowledge in causal terms. As a physicist causally interacts with his subject matter of, of physical objects to gain knowledge of their properties, so the philosopher causally interacts with his subject matter of concepts to gain knowledge of their properties. That is, concepts are psychological entities that we investigate in conceptual analysis, and these entities play a causal role in producing knowledge con concerning themselves. When I come to know that knowledge is true justified belief, say, it is my concept of knowledge that causally controls the process of analytic belief formation. I arrive at this analysis because of the concept knowledge that I possess. So we might as well say that the concept causes me to arrive at an analysis of that concept. So again, at a deeper level, we find an affinity between the, between the knowledge systems of physics and philosophy, not stark distinction. The acknowledged difference relating to the use of the outer senses comes to seem relatively minor, not a mark of clear superiority on the part of physics we can see a clear, met clear methodological parity. Still, it may be retorted. There is, th there is that, there is, still it may be retorted, there is that clear distinction, and observation is clearly an epistemic virtue, so there is that distinction between the two things. So isn't physics a better empirical, experimental, natural science than philosophy? And given the honorific force of the word science, we can see why someone might want to apply it preferentially to sciences like physics, as opposed to sciences like philosophy, the formal sciences. In reply to this, I propose to make a more radical suggestion. Now I'm going to get a little bit philosophical at this point, not so much appealing to the dictionary. Uh, we can, um, where am I? Physics is, in, is not inherently an observation-based science, and conceptual analysis is not inherently observation-independent. We can, in fact, invert the epistemic basis of the two types of science. This is actually not so very difficult on reflection. Consider first a brain in a vat, observing nothing. All its sensory experiences are hallucinatory. This individual might, however, be an aspiring physicist. Let us stipulate that this physicist in a vat has experiences as of being in a physics lab and performing experiments, but never is really so situated. The vat supervisors, the super scientists, feed in these hallucinations, making sure to provide her, the physicist in a vat, with data that are in fact correct. They simulate the course of experience of an actually veridically perceiving human physicist conducting actual experiments, 
but no real observations are ever made because it's all hallucination. On the basis of these hallucinatory experiences, our aspiring physicists in Nevada might well come to entertain some physical theories. And since the data don't mislead her, because they're fed in especially to be accurate, and she is a scientific genius, she comes up with true physical theories, first following in the path of Newton and somewhat later Einstein. I suggest that she is engaged in the science of physics, even though she never makes any actual observations, only apparent observations. In other words, veridical perception of experimental results is not a necessary condition of doing physical science. Human physics is based on observation, as long, of course, we're not actually brains in vats, which we might be, in which case it's not based on observation. But this is a contingent, not a necessary truth. All the procedures of inference and theory construction are the same for the physicist in a, physicist in a vat as for the physicist in a lab. So it would be quite unwarranted to, to declare the latter are genuine physical scientists and the former not. If you are worried that the, that the vat physicist case at least still involves sensory experience, then consider a further case. All the evidential knowledge possessed by the typical physicist is fed into the genetic makeup of a hypothetical physicist so that she knows all the physical data innately. There are no sensory experiences, even hallucinatory ones, as of a meter reading such and such. No sensory experiences like that. But just, but just such basic beliefs, about what, basic beliefs about what meters read in such and such conditions. Just innately know, has that, those beliefs and they, they count as knowledge. But we, can suppose that there is no innate, but we can suppose there is no innate knowledge of the correct theory that explains all this innately known data. This will require scientific intelligence of a high order. So the would-be physicist here needs to construct theories to explain the data written into her genes. And if she succeeds in doing that, then I submit that she is engaged in physical science. She's a physicist. Yet she never makes any observations, never even has any actual observation experiences. After all, doesn't God have scientific knowledge of the physical universe? Yet he makes no observations, not having any bodily senses. That's just the way we do it, given the limits of what we know before interacting with the world through our sense organs. It is not essential to the very existence of scientific knowledge of physical reality. Science and sense experience are not inextricably linked. The same point can be made in a different way. As things are, we learn about the brain by observing it. We open up the head and take a look, applying various observational techniques. But is this essential to knowledge of the brain, rather than just contingent? What if an, what if an aspiring brain scientist, perhaps more ingenious than we humans are, undertook to learn about the brain by means purely of introspection. He introspects his states of mind, recording their laws and ways, and tries to infer what's going on in the underlying reality of the body. We can suppose that this person has never actually seen a brain. Very, just a very much an inferred entity. Why should he, this scientist, why should he not be able to come up with hypotheses about what the organ is like? He might conjecture that it has a cellular structure. Other organs of the body have been observed to be cellular, so it's reasonable to assume that the, the basis of the mind is also cellular. And also he might suppose that it exhibits localization of function. And even, perhaps we might conjecture, that mental processes are powered by electricity. Many other processes are, and it fits the introspective data nicely, what with the rapidity of mental processes and the like. He might, with sufficient ingenuity, come up with a theory very much like our observation-based theory of the brain. Yet he never observes brains at all, proceeding entirely from introspective data plus the ancillary knowledge of the natural world. I submit that he's still doing neuroscience despite the absence of any observational foundations, purely introspective foundation. Thus, there can be science without observation, though not, of course, without evidence. But philosophy has evidence too, that is, conceptual intuitions. Now my interlocutor is itching to make his final devastating objection, viz. Intuitions are not evidence at all, but just subjective hunches and prejudices. I won't attempt here to reply fully to this kind of objection, having done so, elsewhere in my uh, book, Truth by Analysis. But I will make one point that completely undermines this entire line of objection to the enterprise of conceptual analysis per se. Namely, there is really no reason that conceptual analysis must proceed in a non-observational first-person style, though I see nothing wrong with such a procedure, contrary to some people calling themselves experimental philosophers these days. We can instead opt for a third-person ob third observational conceptual analysis. There are at least two ways of doing this. One is simply to investigate the concept of others by eliciting their judgments about possible cases. We'd say things like, would you describe the following case as an example of knowledge? Then we give an example, say, of true belief, which has no justification. This is the survey method much employed by the social sciences, questionnaire, statistical analysis, and so on. 
It is a method well suited to discovering the content of other people's concepts when that is your main interest, as with anthropological investigation. But it's still conceptual analysis, that is, discovering the necessary and sufficient conditions for the application of a concept. And it is straightforwardly observational, as much as any other survey of opinion. But a second, less orthodox method might involve delving into the brain mechanisms underlying concepts. By discovering the neural correlates of a concept, it might be possible to find out what other concept a given concept embeds. Thus, the concept of knowledge might have a neural correlate that contains as a part the neural correlate of the concept of belief or justification. This would be evidence of a sort that one concept contains another. It would be difficult research to carry out, and rather indirect, but it would surely be observational, you know, MRI machines and so on, and it would result in information about conceptual constituency. So there is nothing inherently non-observational about conceptual analysis. So you can do it first-person way or you can do it third-person way. Such brain information could certainly supplement ordinary first-person inquiry into our concepts. If our first-person conceptual judgments were highly unreliable for some reason, this might be a sounder way to proceed. At any rate, it's not logically ruled out. Such an inquiry would proceed from sensory observational knowledge, by contrast with the hypothetical methods of doing physics and neuroscience that I sketched above. The physicists did a VAT and the brain scientists without any uh, perceptual observation of the brain. To those who champion observationality as the defining mark of the scientific, I ask whether they would agree that conceptual analysis would be methodologically superior to theoretical physics in the scenarios that I just imagined. Somehow I doubt it, which shows that the presence of observation is not so critical to solid science as some people seem to suppose. For we don't derive intellectual prestige inversion as a straightforward corollary of observational inversion, as in these hypothetical cases I just gave. I myself think it is highly invidious and implausible to place so much emphasis on observation as determining what is sound, respectable science. This is a legacy of positivism we can well do without. This brings us to the amorphous but unavoidable question of science and epistemic virtue. The positivists may test ability the central epistemic virtue of any theory in any field of inquiry. And by testability, they meant testability, testability by means of sensory observation. The more observationally testable a proposition is the better. The, sorry, the more observationally testable a proposition is the better. If a proposition or theory is untestable or very hard to test, that is a demerit of the proposition or theory according to positivism. Testability is regarded as the epistemic virtue. I think this produces a highly distorted picture of epistemic virtue. There are certainly several other epistemic virtues. There, was, there are certainly se several other epistemic virtues, such as generality, depth, interest, importance, profundity, objectivity, or even godlikeness. Not only is testability not clearly correlated with these virtues, it also seems inversely correlated with them. The more testable a theory is, the less general and profound it is apt to be. The reason is that human knowledge, particularly scientific knowledge, aspires to transcend the human viewpoint and human limitations to describe the world as it exists independently of the human perspective. But testability directly reflects the nature and limits of human faculties. To be testable is to be testable by humans. This means a maximally testable theory is one, is one that must cling to how the world appears to us, the world as accessible to human faculties. If the faculties are the human senses, then testability is restricted to aspects of the world to which those senses are sensitive. Imagine trying to be a physicist with the feeble senses of a mole or a worm. It would be difficult. The more a theory can be tested by the use of the senses, the more it will be limited to appearances and the less to reality beyond appearances. A maximally testable theory is therefore apt to be trivial, as with a theory, in inverted commas, that lists the colour of objects in one's immediate environment or gives the weight of every person in a particular town. They're very observational, but they're not science. They have very little epistemic virtue. Once a theory attempts to penetrate the local appearances, as with microphysics or cosmology, the harder it becomes to test. The most interesting theory is like to be the one that is the least testable. It might not even be humanly testable at all, yet very interesting nonetheless, and even true. We see this situation played out in contemporary theoretical physics, where the main theoretical options seem virtually incapable of experimental or observational demonstration, string theory, the many worlds hypothesis, and so on. Philosophical theories are notoriously difficult to establish, but they can be extremely interesting, such as Plato's theory of forms, or possible world semantics, or even panpsychism. Philosophy is more like, more like difficult science than easy science, more like theoretical physics than taxonomic botany. We don't think of botany as queen of the sciences simply because its propositions can be easily tested. We understand that testability is just one epistemic virtue among many. Criticizing philosophy because of its lack of observational testability therefore shows a mistaken picture of what epistemic <laughs> virtue consists in. And of course, testability is a discipline relative concept, 
with the formal sciences differing from the natural sciences, as they're usually so called, in respect of how they are tested. Nor should it be forgotten that philosophical propositions are, quite, are often quite straightforwardly refuted. Ah, maybe less. Are there viable conceptions of philosophy according to which it is clearly not a science? Don't say that normative studies fail to be a science because science deals only in facts, not values. That fails to envisage the possibility of moral science, i.e. a scientific value theory. Such an axiological science is, by, is so by a virtue of its rigour, system and organisation, as compared with naive common sense. And certainly many practitioners have sought to develop a science of morals, for example Bentham's quantitative utilitarianism and Kant's deductive deontology. To be sure, some parts of philosophy as it, as it exists today might well not meet high standards of rigour and hence fail to qualify as science. Perhaps something called the philosophy of sex and love would be an example. There is such a thing, it's taught in some places and it, it's not terribly scientific as compared to, say, philosophy of logic or philosophy of physics. Nor need we assert that nothing can be of intellectual value that is not properly scientific. Thus the humanities of literary studies and cultural history, or even marriage counselling and horse whispering, whatever exactly that may be. My position is certainly not that science is the only form of worthwhile cognitive activity. It is just that philosophy as it exists today, and has existed for quite some time, is aptly described as a science, with all the virtues that attach to that particular form of inquiry. But I'm not saying that only scientific knowledge is worthwhile, I, I don't think that, I just think that that's, that's not my motivation for wanting to say that philosophy is a science. I just think it's true to say that it's a science. I suppose this may be contested by many people characterising themselves as Wittgensteinians. They may see a sharp contrast between the activity of philosophy and anything deserving to be called a science. But three points may be made about this. First, philosophy as I conceive it is a sui generis science, not to be assimilated to the so-called natural sciences of physics, chemistry and biology, and these differ among themselves too. I am emphatically not taking physics as my scientific paradigm. I might even take philosophy as my paradigm of the scientific. Second, Wittgenstein's later therapeutic conception of philosophy is, re is really an extreme and minority position, fitting ill with vast tracts of the subject early and late, which Wittgenstein seemed willing to dismiss completely. Third, it's not so clear that no trace of the scientific, in my capacious sense, survives in Wittgenstein's work. The Tractatus is certainly a scientific treatise, in my sense, as is Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica, on which the Tractatus is modelled. Of course, their work was based on Newton's Principia. And even the philosophical investigations can be construed as a kind of treatise in linguistic science, with its naturalistic surveys of the different forms of language and inquiry into natural language grammar. It's much more empirical than the view of the, of the Tractatus. The investigations is quite rigorous and systematic in its way. It's certainly not just a collection of vague poetic pronouncements and gnomic exhortations or unrelated aperçus. It is a piece of analytic philosophy, after all, possessing the kind of rigour and organisation characteristic of such philosophy. It is nothing like the writings of, say, Henry David Thoreau or the utterances of Eastern mystics. And Wittgenstein was himself originally a scientist, of course, an engineer. We might reasonably, reasonably construe him as resisting simply the emblematic pull of the natural sciences interpreted narrowly. It seems to me then that the standard conceptions of philosophy, continuous with empirical science, we associate with Quine and also with Russell, a priori conceptual analysis, which is the view that I favour, and even Wittgenstein's later philosophy, are all compatible with the idea that philosophy is aptly described as a science. And if you look at what is actually done professionally today in university philosophy departments, the impression is overwhelming, no matter what metaphilosophy you may favour. Nor is there, as far as I can see, any cogent reason to resist the label. Then why is it not so regarded? Why don't people regularly think of it as, as a science? The reasons are no doubt many. Misplaced paradigms of the scientific, traditional university classifications of departments and faculties, mistaken ideas of value as something inherently subjective and hence unscientific, so philosophy is partly concerned about value, well, well that's subjective so it can't be scientific, very confused way of thinking. A lingering association with religion and the spiritual. So some people somehow think that philosophy is something to do with religion. But surely part of the reason is the, is the word philosophy, the word. It's epistem et etymology, history and popular connotations. But how can a general love of wisdom, which is what the word philosophy means originally, count as a particular science with its own specific subject matter and method? The name of the subject accordingly blinds people as to its real nature. This is why I have suggested elsewhere that we would do better to rename the subject in order to reflect its true status as a science. 
Just as the other sciences have shed their early labels as species of philosophy, and everybody knows that physics used to be called natural philosophy, <coughs> so we philosophers should shed our traditional and misleading name. Stop, stop calling ourselves philosophers. Unfortunately, there is no convenient alternative name already in existence, so we need to invent a new one or adapt a word already in use. The best word I can come up with is ontics, which for various reasons strikes me as preferable to other possible choices. Ontology, that word, is already, establi is already, is already established in, in, is already in established use as a name for a part of philosophy, though it would otherwise be fine, but it's already used for, as opposed to epistemology. The word ontics, so let's go back to that. It sounds a bit like physics and a bit like ethics, so it's, it's kind of good, and is intended to express the concern of our subject with general questions of being, the being of value as well as the being of fact. I won't try to defend this linguistic choice here. My point is that if you sympathize with my thesis that philosophy is really best viewed as a science, you might well want to have a name for the subject that reflects that fact, as philosophy, the word philosophy, plainly does not. Of course, we could keep both names in use at least for 100 years or so in order to acknowledge the past, it's always been called that, and avoid bafflement. You know, if you say to somebody, what do you, somebody says, what do you do for a living? You say, I'm an ontocist. They're not going to know what you mean. You don't say, we used to, I'm a philosopher, but I've, we've changed our name. But having the name ontics to hand would dispel a lot of misunderstanding, especially in the general public, about what kind of subject philosophy is, and also do justice to its status as a branch of science. The title of this paper might then be recast as The Science of Ontics, instead of The Science of Philosophy, which carries no whiff of oxymoron. Psychologists once decided to rename their subject Behavioural Science because they felt this label better reflected the nature of the discipline they practised. And the newfangled phrase Cognitive Science has much the same point. I mean, would anybody want to say that academic psychology as it exists today is really the study of the psyche? It sounds a bit old-fashioned. I'm making a similar proposal. Ontical science is simply more accurate and descriptive and less misleading about what actually is done under the interparments of philosophy. Using this term in conjunction with the traditional label will foster a better understanding of the field so named, and eventually the term philosophy may fall out of common use, so no physicist ever called, hardly any physicist called themselves natural philosophers. No doubt there was a period in which the study of matter and energy was called both natural philosophy and physics, as the transition from one term to the other was made. I advocate such a transitional period for the field now called philosophy, with ontics the term that will eventually be preferred. If philosophy is indeed a science to be set beside other scientific subjects, then it needs a name that fits its real nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin, for that... Uh that very lucid and provocative talk, and we'd have some time for questions, and Colin's agreed to take some. Uh, I feel, for, can I just say first of all that when you are reading from a prepared text, um, it would be helpful to have some sort of structure to help us sort of uh, digest it, because it seemed to be fairly um, flat in, 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 in its presentation. Mm. And actually, I would have given you a yellow card each time you started from a, defin a dictionary definition, so I don't think that's a very useful way, uh, really, of, of uh, analysing concepts. And I particularly would have given you a red card for the use of the word God, which you did. Anyway, my, my, a my point... A red card means it's a bad thing or a good thing? Red card? Is a red, what does a red card mean? Is it good it or bad? You're, you're sent off. It's bad, OK. Because <laughs> I, I anyway, the word God. Anyway, I, I was particularly keen to come here tonight because I, I do declaim about um, philosophy versus science. And my point is, in fact, that philosophy ends and science begins when you start doing numbers, you know, and that's really a char the, the fundamental characteristic of science is when you start bringing numbers into it. So I'll just give that to you as a sort of repost. Well, yes, let's talk about the, the numbers. Um, of course, if arithmetic is then a science if we, if we bring numbers in, so that's, that's what I'm arguing for that. Philosophy doesn't use uh, numbers or measurement. It does use symbolic notation, but not, not, not actual numbers in measurement. But many sciences don't make that much use of measurement either. So it's not, like a lot of biology it doesn't make that much use of measurement. Evolutionary biology, for example. Anatomy, not much use of numbers in that. So I think that's a little bit too limited as a criterion for what counts as science. Um, also, of course, it wouldn't be sufficient if I say to you there are 80 people in this room, that's not a scientific statement. You need more to make something into a science than merely the, the fact that you're using a number in it. 
So it's a, it's, I think it's a guide to some sciences, but it's not really a, a good definition of what makes something a science. I mean, I, on your first point about my, my methods of presentation, you, I'm, I'm, really, I'm an old-fashioned presenter of philosophy. I, I have not gone the way of using uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations and so forth, which I sort of deplore. And, um, and so I, I insist on a more old-fashioned approach, which I know people find a little difficult sometimes. And that, plus, I'm a very boring speaker. Right, so, so. I'm sorry, that's just the way I am. Uh, yeah, I'm just interested. Why do we have to pigeonhole philosophy as a science or as an art? Why can't we say it is, in fact, an art and a science? Because if we think about it, you know, we have logic, formal logic, as part of philosophy, which is, a, if we say it's the scientific side or the science, and then we have the, you know, the sort of um, metaphysics and epistemology side, which is more the sort of art side. I mean, why do we have to pigeonhole? Why can't we say it actually yeah. is that sort of unique thing um, that actually spans both worlds? I think it's, I think this, uh, I'm, I'm agree with one part of what you're saying, which is we don't want to necessarily oppose philosophy, of science of areas, the arts. I, I talked about the humanities, so my idea was that philosophy is one of the humanities. We can say that, um, but that doesn't mean it's not a science, so they're not inconsistent with each other. I don't, I don't really agree, though, with you, your contrast between, say, formal logic as a science and epistemology as an art. I think epistemology is also a science because it attains that degree of rigour. But some parts of philosophy might be better described as a bit more, whatever word we use, I mean, arts, but then in that same sense, some parts of physics might be described in that way too. We tend to use that word when we find that the thing we're considering is extremely speculative and difficult to verify. So we, there's room for judgment. There's the idea of art you're using. It's the idea we have to use our judgment, and we're using criteria of simplicity, perhaps, or even of aesthetic um, properties of a theory. So I think in it's not just with philosophy you don't want to oppose science and art. In, all across the board you don't want to oppose them too strongly. <laughs> the point about calling philosophy a science really is, you, you, it is to try to recognise the fact that philosophy, as it exists now and has existed for a long time, has the same degree of rigour as many of the things called the sciences. And a lot of people are very misled by what philosophy is about because of the words and they don't quite understand that philosophy is a kind of science. I'll give you one very concrete point about this. The New York Times um, has a section every week called the Science Times and it never covers anything from philosophy in it at all. Never. And it's a very good showcase for academic disciplines to be read by the broader public. But the editors don't think that philosophy is a science, so they, don't, they never cover it. If they, if they were told that philosophy actually is a science, they'd say, oh, let's cover it in the Science Times. And then philosophers would have a little more of a role in intellectual culture. So part of my sort of more political motive for this is to try get people to realise that philosophy is, you know, because philosophy has been kind of eclipsed by the things called the sciences, and we need to affirm that it's some, something with the same interest to people as the sciences are. We just need to call it by that call it by that word, that name, and then things will be a little easier. Besides, my view is it's simply true that it's a science. So, I think that uh, verifiability is is an important issue, and mm. you've you've um, you've ignored the temporal element. So, a hundred years ago, uh, questions that now can be answered and would be called science um, uh, in the past wouldn't be. And so, I would say that philosophy, or many many issues in philosophy are issues that are science for the future. They are, you say many of the issues in philosophy are issues in science because they're verifiable? That was your point? Or was it the opposite of that? Well, mm. yeah. I mean, some people have thought that philosophy is just um, science, the science of the future. That is, it's, it's what a science looks like before it becomes properly a science. Uh, that's the, the first kind of view of philosophy that I distinguish is that. But I, I was arguing from a position where philosophy was a subject consisting of a priori conceptual analysis and was not to be thought of as proto-science. So I was, my question was, given that conception of philosophy, can we say that philosophy is a science? People normally think not. But I, see, I, just, I don't accept the view of philosophy that you were presupposing there, that philosophy is something which would or necessarily might become science in the future. I think that a lot of philosophy is just its own subject matter with its own questions and it's not going to turn into a science. Much of what we call physics is now what? It's just pseudoscience. Pseudoscience, well that could well be. That could well be. I mean a lot of, the word science gets used in various honorific ways as well you see. So um, 
so some, you might say that some of, some of physics is pseudoscience when you're trying to denigrate those parts of physics. And you might suppose that some parts of philosophy are pseudoscience in the same way. Although I think it's a bit less the case in philosophy. There certainly there are some kinds of philosophy that one sort of deplores as being you know, windy rhetoric and it's not sufficiently clear that, that might, that's like pseudoscience. But the standards of argument are just too sloppy. And so you think, you know, this is just you know, this sounding off, there's nothing there. That's, that's, that's worth discussing, nothing clear enough to formulate. This is a view which was held by analytic philosophers about so-called continental philosophers, I think rather unfairly. But there could be, there was certainly would be some people describing themselves as philosophers who make vacuous statements which you can, you can never critically evaluate because they're just too vague. And That's the analogue of pseudoscience. So I'm not, def I'm not saying that's a science. You seem to be hoping to sort of rehabilitate philosophy a bit by showing how like, well, or how it is science, but it seems to me that there's a, a danger in that, in that philosophy actually disappears into science. And I'm not sure if I, if you address this or I missed something, whether you think there's sort of something intrinsic to philosophy that makes it the science that it is. Because otherwise, why not just leave philosophy to the scientists who are already, as you say, with their difficult questions, doing philosophy and may not need the professional philosophers mm. at all. Well, you see, my view of philosophy is that it's conceptual analysis, which makes it totally different from the other sciences. It's a priori, it involves necessary truths. I didn't talk about that today, but it might, that's my view of the nature of philosophy. So I think that philosophy is completely unlike the other sciences, the, the empirical sciences, so-called. So, so, so there's no way in which my view is meant to let the sciences take over from philosophy, on the contrary. I was just saying that on that view of philosophy that I have, which is a very traditional view, I think it goes back to Plato, basically, uh, on that conception there's no reason why we can't call philosophy so conceived a science. So any prestige that is associated with the word science we have in philosophy without trying to change it or somehow ceding it to the scientists in the ordinary sense. So I'm trying to keep philosophy pure and say it can be completely pure subject, just the way it's always been, we're not going to make it turn into science in the ordinary sense. But I'm just considering the question, is it, in that pure form, a science or not? And I'm saying, as far as I can see, it's a science. Um, so I think there's just no good linguistic reason to deny that. Um, some people don't like the view because they feel that if you call it a science, it'll lose some of its charm, you know. But I don't really think that myself. I, I, uh, I think it will re retain its traditional uh, nature. Um, Especially the metaphysics part of uh, philosophy. I don't. I don't want to. I'm not one of those who thinks that metaphysics is going to give way to physics. I think metaphysics is a, really a central part of philosophy. My view is just that metaphysics is a type of is a type of science. Already, without changing it, and without. You know. Firstly, thank you very much for the presentation, which I found uh, both clear and convincing. Um, I think one of the things that marked out progress in the sciences and the humanities is the contribution that they make to each other. One can think of physics towards biology or archaeology towards history. Do you, do you feel that philosophy is making uh, a good contribution to its brother and sister subjects? To the other subjects? In the last 30 years or? Uh, yes. It's a, very, it's a very interesting question. And the, the orthodox view of it is that the other subjects make a contribution to philosophy but philosophy makes no contribution to them. I don't think that. No, I think philosophy makes a major contribution to them. They often don't realise they're doing philosophy when they are. So often physicists will be talking philosophy and not realising that they are. And it's just bad philosophy that they talk. They've never taken a course in philosophy. So they don't really know what it's about. So they have very naive positivist views, which they think somehow are part of being a scientist or a physicist. I think that if uh, scientists were, uh, knew a bit, of, a bit more philosophy, it would help them in what they do, because it's just like that conceptual clarity is really very important in all subjects. I think philosophy, um, it, can, it can't make a contribution to the other subjects in the sense that it makes discoveries that they won't make. I think it, it only proceeds at a meta level of clarifying concepts and perhaps rooting out conceptual confusions is a possible possibility too. So I think there should be an interplay between the two fields. Um, uh, but I don't think we should assimilate one side to the other. I think that's what I think is right. I think philosophy is an autonomous subject. 
uh, and everybody is doing philosophy all the time even if they don't realize it. Um, so it's better that they know they're doing it and get a little bit more uh, explicit about it and be a bit, be a bit more knowledgeable. The comments that you've seen recently from physicists about philosophy are just remarkably philistine, um, ignorant comments. So Freeman Dyson, you know, he's a very distinguished physicist, recently had a, an article in the New York Review of Books about a, bo a book by a man called Jim Holt, a friend of mine actually, about whether, why there's something rather than nothing, that kind of question. And it was just completely ignorant about what philosophy is actually about. He just says, you know, you should just read a book, you know, then you'll know what it's about. Don't sound off in the press, you know, without knowing what it's about. But there's, unfortunately, there is out there quite a lot of anti-philosophical sentiment. I think less so in Europe than there is in America, but quite a lot in America. I have some questions from downstairs that have been conveyed to me by a, a messenger. <laughs> and so let me just read one of them, and maybe two. Seeing one of them is, um, why do you care whether philosophy is a science? If it's for finding the purpose in things, isn't it better to call it a sport? A sport? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this question is, is the meaning of life for you of philosophy, the, the purpose in things. I do think that the question of the meaning of life is a philosophical question. I just don't think that's the whole of philosophy. And if you look at philosophy as it has existed from Plato and Aristotle through all the classic philosophers down to today, the question of the meaning of life has always been one small part of the subject. It's a lot of philosophy has a lot more to do with completely non-meaning of life uh, questions. So I don't have any problem with, uh, with calling those questions science. It, it may be the, the part of philosophy called about the meaning of life might not attain to the level that you want to call it science. Okay, I hope that satisfied people downstairs. The, the, another one is um, from someone who's asking that your question was, is philosophy science? Your answer seems to be yes, because psychology is science and philosophy is basically psychology, <laughs> or ditto with semantics. <laughs> that is not my position at all. No, no I think psychology is a science. Uh, I used to be a psychologist, you know, before I was a philosopher. And so I, I really, one of the reasons I became a philosopher was that psychology was such a bad science, especially at that time, that it wasn't really worth studying as a science. This was, I'm talking about, you know, the late 1960s when behaviorism was still quite influential. Uh, I was very taken with the work of Chomsky at the time, and, and still am actually. Um, and at that time, cognitive science began to develop, and then psychology went in a much, much better direction than it used to be. And maybe I would have stayed a psychologist, I don't know if it had been like that, but in any case it wasn't, so I didn't. So I don't, I, I think psychology um, has improved as a science, but it's still very backward compared to other sciences. Um, but I certainly don't think that philosophy is a science because it's a kind of psychology, and quite the opposite. I don't think philosophy's got anything much to do with psychology at all. There's one branch of philosophy, which is the philosophy of psychology, but almost all of the rest of philosophy has got nothing particularly to do with psychology at all. Um, perhaps I could um, abuse my position, as it were, and ask a direct question here. The um, one reason people draw a distinction between philosophy and science is because... Um, if you look at the way things are now in philosophy and in science, academic disciplines or departments, um, in philosophy there's an enormous amount of disagreement about fundamentals. Mm. So not just about which, which particular experiments show what, but all those distinctions that you made, almost all of them are challenged by people who are perfectly competent and respectable mm. philosophers. Mm. Um, whereas there's no one in physics departments who talk about the crystalline spheres or... Um, the mm. ether anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there seem so there seem to be sort of fundamental disagreements in philosophy, often about the whether philosophy is possible at all. And these people are recognisably philosophers. Do you have a comment? Well, I think what you say is is right, although the significance of it is a bit more difficult to to evaluate. So that list of distinctions I, that I made, like you mentioned type token and so on. Yes, you're you're right that there are there are philosophers who might resist at least formulations of those distinctions. Some they certainly would reject, like analytic synthetic, you know, which Quine rejects. But I think every philosopher would agree that by making that distinction, a, a kind of cognitive progress had been made, even if you actually reject the distinction. So there's some clarif conceptual clarification had occurred. So there'd been, you're moving from A to B a little bit, even when you reject <laughs> the distinction or think it's not been properly clarified. Also, I think we, we have to be a little bit um, less modest about how little we know in philosophy. Because I think some things in philosophy, we, 
really nobody ever questions at all. For instance, there's a lot of debate about how to analyze the content of knowledge, but I don't think any philosopher has ever maintained that there can be knowledge of a falsehood. So everybody knows that if you know that P, it follows that P. There's some people argue, well, does it follow from knowing that P that somebody believes that P? Yeah, but everybody, can, everybody agrees with that. And I think everybody, can, everybody disting, makes certain kind of distinctions, say, between justification and truth. So I think there's a, a, a large body of background knowledge that all philosophers share, and that's ignored because they get into the disagreement straight away. And when you, if you, when you study philosophy as a student, you have a very strong feeling that you're learning something you didn't know before, even if it's just options and clarification and so forth. So it may be that writing to say is that philosophy is, is um, very controversial science or difficult science or something like that and doesn't have a very firm evidential basis the way the other sciences have. That's probably true, but we shouldn't exaggerate it too much. But it's... The main thing that I was arguing against, of course, is the idea that being empirical is the whole thing that makes the difference, whether something's empirical. So I think philosophy can be argued to be a science in which the, there's very little agreement, but still a science, because we're not going to make being empirical so important to it. Thank you. Can I take one more question? If philosophy is a science, are there some areas of the philosophy syllabus which are going to have to change their name and move to other departments because they're just not a science? I'm thinking of something like jurisprudence. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that would be good, no. I mean, mathematical logic used to be very much more part of philosophy and did shift more to the math department. So the people in the math department study mathematical logic. A typical philosophy, a philosophy department will have one person in mathematical logic. But that has migrated a little bit outside because it became a lot more like, like maths. But areas like, say, jurisprudence or anything else to do with ethics, I don't think those should move to another, another department. I think those are definitely part of philosophy. But I don't mind, call, I don't mind calling those a science, you see. I think that's a moral science. That's in Cambridge they always call the moral sciences. It just means, science really, in my mind, just means a systematic, reflective, rigorous study, subject, study of a particular subject matter, roughly. So if you're dealing with uh, ethical theory as it's existed now for really a long time, it's a pretty rigorous subject. It's not just a matter of opinion or poetic pronouncements. There are really clear issues. For example, the difference between deontologists and utilitarians. You know, that issue is very clearly formulated. You, know, you can debate it. You can produce examples where people will say, I, I see why that's a problem for the utilitarian. I see why that's a problem for the Kantian. I don't myself think that ethical theory as it now exists, or even meta-ethics, is inferior methodologically to many other areas of philosophy. I think it's pretty solid. But I even hold the view myself that ethical knowledge is a lot more solid than uh, scientific knowledge, because I think ethical knowledge is a priori. So I think empirical knowledge is always based on induction. I think induction is pretty shaky epistemologically, so I think that ethical knowledge is more like mathematical knowledge, a priori and much more certain. So I think in ethics, actually, when, when I'm teaching this to students, you, know, you discuss the question of, of whether pain is bad. You know, I, I think we know a priori and with certainty that pain is bad. For instance, or that torture is wrong, or that you know, and so on, and happiness is good. I don't think there's much. I don't think there's really any dispute about that. You see, <laughs> in physics there can be a lot of disputes about atomic theory and so forth, but um, and they're understandable. But I, and you, they can even be epistemological questions about even our knowledge of the external world in physics. You know, because that's a traditional epistemological problem. You know, that they can't talk about skepticism. But in ethics, you can't really have sceptical doubts about it, some eth basic ethical knowledge. It's completely certain, <laughs> as certain as any knowledge is. Well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time, so I hope you'll join me in thanking Colin for a most stimulating lecture. Thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, Tim, for chairing so expertly. And, of course, huge thanks to Colin um, for a really fantastic lecture. And as a small token of our gratitude, we have a gift you for you, which is a guide for hall and gardens. Fantastic. Uh, thank to you. To remind you of Maddingly when you're further away. When I'm on my balcony, I look at exactly. the beach in Miami. Yes. yes. Perfect, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah.
And of course, as always, I'd just like to thank my colleagues for helping with arrangements for this evening and hope that I will see many of you back here at the Institute of Continuing Education in future, either for Maddingly lectures or Maddingly concerts, or indeed for the Festival of Science, um, or perhaps even studying with us. Um, you should all have a brochure on your seats. Please do take them away with you. There are further brochures of our courses out on the gallery. And also in your lecture programme for this evening, there are details of further philosophy opportunities that um, are coming up in the near future. So just as an example, um, Colin is giving a lecture this coming weekend on Saturday the 24th of November at 4.30, Shakespeare and Philosophy. And that again is a free, open, uh, public lecture which any of you can come to. You just need to email to let us know that you will be coming. And the relevant email address is in your lecture program, so do take that away. And also, there's um, information in here about our philosophy open afternoon, which is on the 2nd of December, when you can come along and find out about our new philosophy courses, what's involved with um, studying philosophy here at ICE. And again, you just need to let us know that you intend to come by sending us an email to the relevant address. So, for your diaries, the next Maddingley Lecture is on the 18th of February 2013, when Professor Rebecca Stott will speak on Historian as Detective, the search for Darwin's predecessors. You'll be very welcome to join us then here at Maddingley Hall. Thank you and good evening.